And so today I'm going to dive once more into that book, into chapter 13 of the book of Numbers. But before I do that, I want to tell you a story about two brothers from a small village in the eastern cape of South Africa. And these two were twins, and they had a hard start to life. They were very poor, and there was often no food in the house. Their mother tried to earn a little money by cleaning, but most of the nearby houses were also very poor, and there wasn't a lot of work. And whatever she did earn, their father would spend on alcohol. And he himself was a mean, tempered, and violent man. Well, one day when these two brothers were still at school, there was a bus accident and their parents sadly were killed. The brothers were taken to an orphanage where their conditions became even worse. Now at the age of 17, they were able to leave the orphanage and they left the area and went their separate ways. Years later, their mother's sister, their aunt, managed to track them down. She wanted to know what had become of them and she discovered that one of the brothers had become an engineer. He'd studied hard, he'd worked hard, and he now owned a construction company. He had a loving wife and three healthy children, but the other brother was himself an unemployed alcoholic with no sense of direction for his life. His brother had tried to find and help him, but his help had been rejected and spurned. Now, the aunt asked the engineer how did your life turn out like this? And he replied, what did you expect with a childhood like mine? She moved on to the other brother with the same question, how did your life turn out like this? And he too said, what did you expect with a childhood like mine? Now that story is about perception, about underlying mental framework, about the same experiences the same data being perceived and understood in different ways depending on our worldview. The one brother used the terrible start to his life to motivate change. The other used it as an excuse for despair and hopelessness. And today as we examine the chapter 13 of the book of Numbers, I trust we will see the importance in the history presented here of the underlying mental framework and how a heart that is trusting in God is fundamentally different to one that is not. Now this chapter, Numbers 13, and the one that follows it, though they're not in the numerical centre of the book of Numbers, are in a way the central event in that book. In some ways they're the central event of Israel's wilderness period. Chapters 13 and 14 detail the major rebellion of Israel against God against his will for them, their refusal to go into the promised land of Canaan. This is the event for which Israel was disciplined such that the entire generation, millions of people, were caused to remain in the wilderness until they died, taking a total of 40 years. Numbers 26.64 says, But among these, talking about the people finally going into the land 40 years later, there was not one of those listed by Moses and Aaron the priest who had listed the people of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they shall die in the wilderness. Not one of them was left except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. This event, recorded in Numbers 13 and 14, is the central example of the central message of the whole of the book of Numbers, which is... God's faithfulness. The book of Numbers is about God's faithfulness, despite the demonstration over and over again in that book that the people are unfaithful. God is faithful to his promises. As you recall, the Israelites had left captivity, had escaped from captivity in Egypt at the conclusion of the plagues with the first Passover, and they had been led by God's mighty hand to Mount Sinai also known as Mount Horeb. And that journey had taken about three months, and during that time God miraculously led them in the pillar of cloud and fire and brought them through the Red Sea, delivering them from the pursuing Egyptian army, and fed them manna and quail 
and provided water in dry and bitter places and had also given them military victory over the Amalekites. And there at Mount Sinai, God spoke to them. He gave them the commandments and the law and he formed them into a nation. And they stayed there for about 10 months until God led them out towards the promised land. Having first prepared them in the 20 day period that the first part of the book of Numbers details and all that preparation was getting them ready for the invasion of Canaan. Recall that in Numbers 1, the first event after the consecration of the priesthood is the census. The census was the formation of the Canaan invasion force, the formation of God's army, and that demonstrated to the people God's faithfulness to his promise to Abraham to multiply him into an exceedingly great number and to give them the land of Canaan. The census should have given them great confidence not in their own numbers, but in God's promise and his faithfulness to his promise. And that should have allowed them to take confidence in God that he was in fact doing all that he said that he would do. The census was a gift of grace to teach their wayward hearts that God is trustworthy. And in all the rest of the time at Sinai, there were further lessons from God. They received proof after proof after proof of his faithfulness to his promises and about his character and his presence with them in their very midst and his trustworthiness culminating immediately before they left Sinai in the famous Aaronic blessing at the end of Numbers chapter 6. And when I was here last, I preached on the Aaronic blessing, a blessing full of meaning to them about God's faithfulness, his preservation of them, his deliberate pleasure in them, his unmerited favour and his special watchful attention, and the promise, finally, of peace, of shalom. Now Deuteronomy 1 tells us that it could be about an 11-day journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, but of course they did not go that fast. Their passage was interrupted by their own sin along the way. Sinai had revealed the goodness and the promises of God, but the journey north revealed the unregenerate hearts of the people, which are detailed in chapters 11 and 12 of Numbers. But now at the start of Numbers 13, they have finally arrived at Kadesh Barnea, in the wilderness of Paran, just near the southern border of the Promised Land. And this is the launching spot for the invasion of Canaan. This is where they are assembling before they go in and take possession of it prepared in every necessary way by God and given every proof that they can be confident in Him. They should have been going in with that mindset, that underlying philosophy of life, that mental framework of faith. So let's turn now to Numbers 13 and read that chapter. And I want to warn you that this passage is a bit challenging to read. There are a lot of names here and some of them sound very odd to our ears. But nevertheless, I'm going to read the chapter because it is part of the inspired word of God and every part of that word is precious and of great value. Just before I do read, let me pray. Father, thank you for this passage before us and all it reveals of you. Thank you that you are faithful and trustworthy, that you fulfill every promise. As we study your word today, may we behold wonderful things of your character and goodness. Help me this day to faithfully bring your mighty word to your precious people. I pray that you would use me, though I am but weak and foolish. Use me by your spirit to bring a good word this morning for the building up of your people and to your glory and the praise of your name. Amen. Numbers 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the people of Israel. And these were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, 
the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Igel, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, that is, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamaliel. From the tribe of Asher, Sethur, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vophshi. From the tribe of Gad, Geuel, the son of Maki. These were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is, and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob, near Lebo Hamath, and they went up into the Negeb and came to Hebron. Ahiman, Sheshai, and Telmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came into the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and they told him, We came to the land which, to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, This land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Now I want us to look today from this text at the mission of the spies the reminder of God's promise, the reminder of God's faithfulness, the report of the spies, and the faith of Caleb versus the people's response, and then it's some application for us. So firstly, let me talk to you about the mission of the spies, verses 1 to 20, but you need a bit more information, and there is another passage, another account of these events in Deuteronomy 1 that gives us a bit more detail. So just put a bookmark in Numbers 13, for a moment, because we'll flip back and forth a little bit between these passages and come to Deuteronomy 1. And remember that in this passage in Deuteronomy 1, Moses is speaking to the next generation of Israel, those who were just children at the time that we've just read about. The oldest of them would have remembered that event when the spies went up and would have it in mind even as Moses speaks to them here. Now, the events of Deuteronomy occur as they are finally about to go into the promised land to fulfill the task that their parents failed to fulfill. Deuteronomy 1, 
19 to 23. Then we set out from Horeb, this is Moses speaking, and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you've come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. This thing seemed good to me, and I took twelve men from among you, one man from each tribe. So the people had arrived at Kadesh Barnea and they were poised to go into the land, but first they wanted to have people go up and spy it out. The notion came from the people, Deuteronomy 1 tells us, and it seemed good to Moses, and God affirms it in Numbers 13 verse 1. In fact, he made it a command to go up and spy it out, and he gave wise and specific instructions about who should be involved. Verse 2, one from each tribe. So in their tribal representatives here, the whole nation of Israel is represented. All Israel participated in the recognizance. And therefore no one could accuse any other tribe since they all and their representatives saw it firsthand. And what it also means for them, of course, is that the whole nation was therefore complicit in the sin that followed. We see that in Numbers 14 verse 1. All the congregation raised a loud cry, the whole nation. Now these men, the spies in verses 4 to 16, were likely fairly young men, probably in their 40s, which is fairly young, and so suited to the physical task of spying out the land. But they were still chiefs among the people, well-known leaders within each tribe. We see in our list Caleb, son of Jephunneh, in verse 6, who we know was 40 years old at the time. And Joshua, in verse 8, his name here given as Hoshea, and then verse 16 explains that Moses changed his name to Joshua. That may have happened at this time, and we can't be sure. But that change is interesting because his name goes from Hoshea, which means desire for salvation, to Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation. And that seems to indicate perhaps a more settled conviction in the heart of this man, that his desire for salvation is fulfilled. Now they were tasked to spy out the land. See that in verse 2. Now this word spy out means to thoroughly search, to seek something out and explore it. The emphasis being not that it's covert, as we might think of spying, but more a sense of exploration. And again, Deuteronomy 1 helps us, in verse 22, the idea was to do a route-finding mission. Remember, none of these people had ever been there before, not even Moses, and they didn't have Google Maps or any kind of map to help them, just some oral tradition about the patriarchs. So they needed to know which way to go. There are a lot of them, after all, and they need to know the way and what cities are there. And verse 17 gives us Moses' instruction to the spies. There are a series of questions that they need answers to about the land, the people, and the cities. About the land, what is it? Is it good or bad? Is it rich or poor? And are there trees? About the people, are they weak or strong? Few or many? And are the cities camps or strongholds? Moses is after a factual report. He wants a realistic assessment of what they're up against. And spies, also, please bring back some fruit while you're at it. Now that begs a question, don't you think? The question, why? Not from the people's point of view. We know why they wanted the spies to go up. But why did God allow it? In fact, why did God command it? He knew the way. He knew the route they should take and the cities that were there and the people's strength and number. So why did God command the spies to go up? Well, I want you to just hold that question in your mind because I will attempt to answer that later. But first I want you to see something in the text, and this is the second point in my outline. I want you to see the reminder of God's promise. 
Look again at verse 2. God deliberately inserts a phrase into his instruction to Moses, which is not necessary for that sentence to make sense. Where are the spies to go? To the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. Now, God didn't have to put that in there. He is deliberately reminding them here of his promise, his trustworthy promise, the promise given to Abram way back in Genesis 12, 7. To your offspring, I will give this land. Restated in Genesis 15 and 17, the promise that they knew that they should have been counting on, of which they should have been anticipating the fulfillment that God had reinforced to them in all their journey so far from Egypt. This is the land I am giving, definitely, without question. Not the land I might give, but the land I am giving. And Deuteronomy 1 is even more explicit. Verse 20, you've come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving to us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. God sent them up with his faithful promise literally ringing in their ears. These men were not going up to decide whether the land was conquerable. In fact, their opinion about this is never sought, though they do give it. No, that was not the question. God had said he was going to give it to them, so he had spoken, and so it was. Now thirdly, there is also in the geography that is mentioned here a reminder of God's faithfulness. If you look at verse 21, they went up into the land and they were there 40 days and they undertook a significant trip from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob, from the very southernmost to the very northernmost parts of the land. They thoroughly explored it. But there is another place mentioned here not on a boundary, not on an edge of their exploration, and so its mention here is therefore significant. They came also, verse 22, to Hebron. Now why is that mentioned specifically? What is the significance of Hebron? What did they know about Hebron with the promise God had made to Abram and so recently restated to them? I think there is significance in the mention of Hebron. Hebron is where Abram dwelt, where Abram received that very promise in Genesis 15, where the birth of Isaac was promised in Genesis 18, and where Sarah and Abram and Isaac and Israel were buried in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron facing Mamre. What stirred in the hearts of the spies as they came into Hebron, as they remembered their history and the promise God had made to them, what should have stirred in their hearts, trust in his faithfulness, excitement to be coming into their heritage after so long, joy that his word would be fulfilled. I think Caleb's heart was stirred as he came into Hebron, as he looked and saw the place of his ancestors, as he remembered the stories that Jephunneh had told him about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the promise that God had made to them? Did he perhaps see the altar that Abram had made? Did he see the cave where they were buried? Hebron was by now a built city, so we don't know, but the significance of that place was nonetheless clear to Caleb at least. Just come over with me to Joshua 14 for a minute. This chapter records events that took place 45 years later. Joshua, who was one of the spies, remember, is now the leader of the Israelites, and he is portioning out the land to the tribes. He and Caleb are old now, in their 80s, the only two from all the adults who left Egypt who are still alive. And this is what Caleb says to him, reading from verse 6. And the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, 
and I brought him word as a, again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses. While Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. So Caleb understood at Hebron all that he was being shown. He got the significance of that place, that God took them there for a reason, as an encouragement, as a testimony to his own faithfulness. That's why Caleb wanted Hebron for his own portion, because of what the Lord taught him there. But there was something else that stirred in the hearts of the ten unfaithful spies when they were at Hebron. Look again in Numbers 13 at verse 22. Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai were there, the descendants of Anak. These are the Anakim. And the ten looked at these people, and what stirred in them was fear. They were so afraid. But who are these people, these sons of Anak? Well, they were tribes that lived around Hebron, and what is clear from Scripture is that they are physically very imposing people, tall people. So they were in that area, that area famous by association with Abraham and the patriarchs, association with the promises that God had made concerning the land, and that is all the ten could see. Not the echoes in that land of the promises of God, not the comfort and reassurance and excitement of all his faithfulness, no, their underlying framework for interpreting what they saw was not based on God's promises and his revealed character of faithfulness. They didn't have that framework. They didn't have the faith to understand what Hebron signified, to understand what God would do. All they saw was what their eyes told them. And fourthly, in my outline, what about their report from verse 25? They came back to Kadesh Barnea at the end of their 40 days and they were carrying fruit. A lovely big bunch of grapes and also other delicious things. What a sight that would have been to the people. The people who only recently before had craved anything but manna, had craved so severely that their gluttony over the quail had resulted in a very severe plague of judgment from the Lord. Now here is this luscious fruit. And the first report that they give in verse 27 seemed so good. We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Oh my, fantastic. This is just what God said it would be like. Exodus 3.17, I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is further confirmation for all the people of God's promise, of his faithfulness, further gracious evidence that he was doing all he said for them. And now I think we can begin to answer the question that I posed before. Why did God command the spies to go up? Why did he, what did he want to show them? What report did he want the people to receive? Deuteronomy 1.25, that it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us, that it is fertile and abundant, flowing with milk and honey. 
but there's more, I think. Another purpose for God to send them up. He wanted them also to see the strong cities and the vigorous people and the sons of Anak. Why? So they would trust him and not themselves. So they would be dependent. So they would say, yes, there will be challenges. Yes, there will be hardships to this. But God is with us and he has promised and we trust him and the glory will be his. They wanted and hoped to go up and find small, weak people in poorly defended camps. But if that had been the case, they would trust in themselves to defeat them. They would have trusted in their own strength and not in God's promise. They were looking to see if they could defeat the people, not trusting in God to do so. See how they don't even praise God for the richness of the land. They say, yep, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as if it came to be that way by accident, instead of by God's providence and according to his purpose. There's no trust here. Despite all the promises and evidences, and that is the point. The ten went up without God in their hearts, with a frame of reference that didn't acknowledge him. So when they saw the big guys, they were out. They were shaken because they believed in human rather than spiritual realities. And so their hearts were troubled. They took into consideration only what they saw in Canaan, with a total disregard for that which had been made clear by God since the beginning of the Exodus, a reality which was no less actual, namely his unlimited power. They were walking by sight only, and not by faith. So fifthly, let's contrast the faith of Caleb. I want you to see clearly here the difference that Caleb's underpinning confidence in God makes compared with the others. Now Joshua doesn't speak here. He does so in chapter 14, so that we know that he too has the same confidence in God that Caleb has. These men had all seen the same things. They'd all made the same journey, faced the same hardships. They'd all seen the fortified cities and the tall, strong people. They'd all been to Hebron and seen the sons of Anak. But Caleb had a completely different perspective. He had examined the same data, but come to the opposite conclusion. You see it in verse 30. Let us go up at once, he says, and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb is reckoning on the promises of God, not on his own strength or the strength of the people. Numbers 14.9 makes that clear. Caleb says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. It was not because Caleb alone had heard God's promises. It was not because he alone had seen the evidences of those promises. They had all seen the truths that God had revealed in the preparation for this time. Now Caleb and Joshua had a different report because they alone, out of all the 12 spies, had faith in the one who made the promise. They were walking by faith and not by sight, as 2 Corinthians 5 instructs us. They had a different mindset, a different underpinning framework for understanding all that they saw. This is what faith in God gives. Their hearts were not shaken, despite the big people and the strong cities, because they trusted in the faithful promises of God. Their investigation assumed that God was true to his word. So they had the confidence to stride through a hostile land knowing that God would do all he had said. Not so the other ten. They draw a conclusion in verse 31 that they were never asked for. We are not able to go up against the people. And you'll see here how their story begins to distort the truth. It's fear that does this. They now give a bad report of the land. They say it devours its inhabitants. And now they report that... All the people are of great height, and not just the Anakim. 
There is exaggeration and distortion here because they are afraid. They are shaken and they are believing not in God, but in the lie of the temptation to ignore his promise. And they bring up the Nephilim. They say in verse 33 that the sons of Anak are not just big chaps, but rather they take on this mythical status. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim. And so we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Now the Nephilim refers to a group who were in the land before the flood. And the word is associated with the fearsome status of these people. They were very large and very violent. Now there is some speculation about this word, which I'm not, you'll be pleased to know, going to go into. But the most fitting idea is that these were very physically large and violent men. These were big guys. Think Andre the Giant sized guys. But enraged and violent and these guys had a reputation. You can see it there in the report of the ten. They were sore afraid. They were quailing because of these big fellows. And so they associate them with these semi-mythical men, the boogeymen, the fabled, violent, gigantic men. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. No reference here to God. Just hoping to have confidence in their own flesh and utterly failing. It puts me in mind of King David as he faced a similar giant, the Philistine Goliath. Goliath too terrified the men of Israel because of his size. And 1 Samuel 17 records that when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afra afraid. They all fled from him. But David had a different perspective. He didn't look at the size of the man and quake because he knew God's power. He says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And then to Goliath he says, You come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. The battle is the Lord's. That was David's confidence. Now let's look at the people's response. Back to Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. They raised a loud cry. They wept. They grumbled. They rebelled. Flip back to Deuteronomy 1 again, verse 26. Moses says, Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we, the cities are great and fortified up to heaven, and besides we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. The people believed this report that the spies gave, the ten spies. They did not believe God, they did not believe or remember all he had graciously shown him. They did not have an underlying trust in him. They did not reckon on his promises. No, they immediately resorted to the untrusting behavior that they had previously revealed. They grumbled, accusing Moses and Aaron, and thereby God himself, of wickedness toward them, of bringing them all that way only to be killed. Now remember that these people had been blessed beyond reckoning, provided for miraculously in every way since their flight from Egypt, eyewitnesses to the mighty power and profound holiness of God, but still they had evil, unbelieving hearts. And so they rejected and mutinied against God's appointed leaders, and they rejected the land that God had provided, the land of promise. This is the full and final rebellion. They rejected God's lordship over them and effectively accused him of being evil. See it there in Numbers 
Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? They accused him of wanting their wives and children dead, and they utterly impugned his character. Caleb and Joshua try once more to call the people back to faith in the promises of God and to remind them that God is with them in their midst. Chapter 14, verse 7. The land which we pass through despite out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. What should the people's response have been? Well, it's interesting to reflect that their own children, those whom they fearfully said would become prey, did actually go into the promised land about 40 years later under the leadership of Joshua. And the enemy at that time was no less fearsome. The cities no less fortified. What did they do when contemplating their entry into a hostile land? You can read about it in Joshua chapters 1 to 4. They consecrated themselves. They obeyed God even when the instructions seemed strange. And they therefore were given the victory. They had a theological grid of faith, you see, which underpinned their actions. They trusted in God's promise. They remembered his past actions. They trusted in his faithfulness. They trusted in his generosity. And they trusted in his power. There's a clear contrast here between Caleb, and Joshua, and the ten. There are two ways to live, to be, to view the world. There's Caleb's way, and there's the way of the majority. What was it about Caleb that made him different? Faced with the same data, what was it that made Caleb God's faithful one? It was simply the assumption, the perspective, the truth, that God is real and powerful and faithful to his promises. And the alternative to that is the way of the ten, which assumes that we are on our own, in the world and must rely on ourselves. Simply put, a way of faith versus a way of fear. And finally, we have to ask the question, what should this mean to us? The ten spies had what Hebrews chapter 3 calls evil, unbelieving hearts. Just come to Hebrews 3 with me now. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and following. Therefore the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter. Why? Because of unbelief. Why did they always go astray? Verse 10 said that they have not known his ways. Now they saw his ways. The whole nation saw them over and over, but they did not know them. Verse 12 tells us why. Because of their hearts. Verse 13, hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And then verse 19, what is the root cause of it all? Unbelief. The Israelites failed to commit themselves to God in faith. They were ultimately, for the most part, unbelievers. 
this admonition in Hebrews is to us to believe and be saved, to take care lest we actually have evil, unbelieving hearts as they did. We cannot begin to have trust in God's promises without first placing our trust in Him in salvation. We must place our trust in God so that our underlying framework, our whole world view, is transformed. God's promises don't even apply to you if you are not His, if you're not one that He has rescued from sin in salvation. If that is you today, then do not harden your heart, but repent of your sin and believe in the life and death and resurrection of Christ to save you. Put your faith in Him and be saved and then the promises of God will apply to you. You who are already his, you children of God, what is your underlying framework for understanding the world that you see, the events of your life? Israel had received promises regarding this land, and though they had a difficult task before them, they had the assurance of their utterly faithful God that he would give it to them and be with them as they took it. We too, if we belong to Christ, have received utterly trustworthy promises. Do we trust him? Do we assume in all we do that he is trustworthy and faithful to his word, or do we waver? Do we doubt? Are we shaken when we see the challenges of life, the figurative big men? Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Romans 9.5, God will do what he said he will do. Like the Israelites, we too are in a hostile land surrounded by enemy forces. Shall we cling to the promises of God and be able, like Caleb, like David, to rest in the fact that the battle is the Lord's? Will we be able to see, as Caleb could and did, I have followed God fully? This comes when we have faith in God and when we obey Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Indeed, the Scriptures are full of reassurances to us to enable us to see life this way. I bet you can think of many. Here are two. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And John 14.27, the words of our Master, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let not your hearts be troubled. So if you are his, then know that he is utterly faithful, utterly trustworthy, and what he has said he will surely do. His faithfulness endures to all generations. So plan in 2021 to trust God, to trust his promises, And when you see the trials of life, to know that they are there for a purpose, and that though you cannot do it without him, you can say with Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, namely through Christ, and then rejoice in his promises fulfilled. I close with Philippians 4, 6. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, that you are utterly trustworthy, and that what you have said you will do. We thank you for Caleb and for Joshua. Though just men like us, you gave them faith. And they served you wholeheartedly despite the difficulty. We long to be that faithful. Thank you that you kept your promise to Abram. That you kept your promise to him also 
that all the families of the earth would be blessed in his line, which you fulfilled in Christ our Master, in whom is the fulfillment of every promise. We pray that we may not be shaken, that we may not have a spirit of fear, but of power and a strong mind. May we be strong in your word, and may we come at last to our rest in you. Amen.